Well, welcome back to rainy Northern California. It's Friday the 24th of March now. Got about an inch in the rain gauge here in the uh, foothills of Northern California at the 3200 foot elevation, not far from Oroville Reservoir. When I came home on Thursday from my last trip, I poured out nearly four inches of rain in this rain gauge. So the point being, it's been raining a pretty fair amount here in Northern California and up in the Feather River watershed. Some of the best news of this whole Oroville situation broke just two days ago on the 22nd of March. Sheriff Hone lifted the evacuation warning at Oroville. So congratulations for everybody in the affected area. The evacuation warning has been lifted. Sheriff Hone stuck to his word and, and insisted that that water level get down below 850 feet and remain controlled and the repairs on the emergency spillway the temporary repairs on the emergency spillway be done and that's that's all happened and the Hyatt power plant is operating so he has lifted the emergency evacuation warning remember too since the folks of FEMA have showed up the locals have a much better evacuation plan now in place to avoid the huge fiasco that was created back on the day that they had the actual evacuation so you everybody in the affected area knows and understands they have a completely new evacuation plan which in the highly unlikely event that should ever be have to be used again will result in a much cleaner safer and less chaotic evacuation than what actually occurred so let's go inside and check out the real-time numbers where it's a little warmer and drier and we've got some interesting new reports we've got a new race is starting now the engineering race the design race how are we going to get through not only this spring but what repairs are the folks at Orville going to be able to put into place for over this summer to get us through next year's rainy season and then what's the final design outcome going to be to repair the damaged Orville spillway First, let's take a look at some of this beautiful High Sierra footage just released today by the Department of Water Resources of a couple of reservoirs high up in the Feather River watershed. This is Frenchman Lake. Located just north of the burgeoning metropolis of Chilkoot, California, Frenchman feeds into Little Last Chance Creek, which dumps into the Sierra Valley, which eventually feeds into the middle fork of the Feather River. I want to grab this freeze frame from the beginning of this video to show that despite mainstream media reports of water being held back in these reservoirs, these reservoirs have been flowing out of their dams. And you can see on the right side of this picture, they've been flowing normally this whole winter time. It's just now that the water is topped out high enough for, these, for the spillway here at Frenchman Lake to begin pouring over. We'll look at Google Maps of this spillway closer and show you how high it is. I wanted to grab this freeze frame just to show you the size and scale, how much smaller we're talking about here at Frenchman Lake with these guys standing on the right. We're talking flows on the order of hundreds of cubic feet per second as opposed to thousands. So not an alarming amount of water and plenty of flood control space left in Oroville Reservoir to handle this spillway flow. Next, let's go to Davis Lake, home of the notorious Pike fiasco, as Northern California anglers are very familiar with this long running problem of Pike that <laughs> was somehow introduced into Davis Lake and the DWR's response and Fish and Game's response in handling that crisis has prevented Davis Lake from being this full since 1996 for fear of introducing the Pike into the Feather River system. Note two in the bottom right hand corner of this picture, water has been flowing normally out of the base of the dam through this small power plant this entire season out of Davis Lake. Coming up next is a closer look at the end of the spillway there and that pipe at the end I believe is an anti-icing or de-icing measure to keep the end of the spillway from icing up. Again, very small flows out of this spillway which feeds into Grizzly Valley Creek and heads down towards the town of Portola and into the Middle Fork Feather River. Now that's where this, this runoff could possibly become a problem is up in the Sierras around the town of Portola. And there on the left, you can see the main flow coming out of the powerhouse that's been flowing this whole time. 
When the weather clears, I'll give you guys an aerial overview of this whole watershed in the beautiful High Sierra. Quick Google map overview of where we're talking about in the watershed. Here is Oroville Reservoir, North Fork, Middle Fork, South Fork of the Feather River. Head east up into the High Sierra. Here is the Sierra Valley and Portola. And just north of Portola is Lake Davis. And just to the east of that is Frenchman Lake. Let's take a look at that spillway with the Google Earth view. And here you can see the spillway at Frenchman is pretty much right at the top of the reservoir. Let's go take a look over at Davis Lake, home of the famous Pike fiasco. And same thing, the spillway at Davis Lake is located right at the top of the lake. And there's the power plant where the water's been flowing. One of the larger and more interesting lakes in the watershed is this Lake Almanor, where they've got several ways of getting the water out of here. Before they use the spillway, they've got this structure located right here. And the water from Almanor two different directions. One is a tunnel to Butt Valley. Yes, I said it right. Butt Valley Reservoir located right over here. B-U-T-T, -T, not B-U-T-T-E. And out the bottom of the dam right there. The funny thing about this reservoir is I believe this spillway is located slightly higher than the north end of the reservoir. So if the spillway to Lake Almanor uh, has to flow, then I'm afraid parts of Chester may very well be get flooded. But so far, that's not been a problem. They've been able to get plenty of water out of Lake Almanor using the existing flood control structure. Other lakes in the watershed include Bucks Lake and Little Grass Valley Reservoir located right down here, all of which have been flowing normally this winter. Time to take a look at the real-time numbers for Friday, the 24th of March. Reservoir elevation continues to drop down to 843 feet and change. Outflows remain steady at 44, 45,000 CFS. Again, 40,000 out of the spillway and 5,000 out of the Hyatt power plant. So they are still able to operate the power plant and the spillway simultaneously. Inflows have been fluctuating and generally well, they're trending all over the place, as usual, this time of year, 20 up to 30,000 CFS. And generally trending down. I think that's going to trend back up here with the uh, weather in the forecast, which we'll take a look at. Here's the Sierra 7-day forecast from KCRA. Looks like precipitation all the way through Monday for now, and then clearing. Also note, the snow levels nice and cold down to 4,000 feet on Monday. That's good. Here's the current weather radar loop showing the precipitation over the Oroville area and then of course through orthographic lifting as the precipitation and the weather hits the Sierras. The clouds rise, the water condenses and more rain and snow is produced higher up in the Feather River watershed. And fortunately, now that's mostly snow. Looking at the big picture, this front is sagging to the south and heading out of Dodge. More precipitation coming this weekend. I want to thank YouTube viewer Robert Callies, I believe that's how you say your last name, for getting me links to these important new documents. Here's the FERC, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission's uh, notice that they are going to start their forensic investigation who's on the team, and what their objectives are. Find out, get to the bottom, root cause of this spillway failure. And I'll provide links to these documents on this update in the comments section. If you have Google Earth at home, you can kind of do your own little forensic analysis real quick. If you go to view, there's historical imagery. And if you look at 42015, that's about your best picture you're going to see of the state of the spillway before the incident. And if you zoom in, 
Let me get it zoomed in and tilted correctly here. If you get her zoomed in and tilted correctly near the side of this access road, you'll see what a lot of the investigators are going to be focusing on. This, this repair work done right here. That could very well be the beginning of the end of this spillway. You'll see a, a few other cracks and imperfections in this Google Earth view. Interesting stuff just to look at. And on the same time frame, 414 of 15, you can see the inlet to the spillway showing how it works and how that water level of 235 feet, feet is about as low as you can go using the main spillway before you begin causing scouring or eroding of this inlet structure. And even more interesting is this March 17 memo showing the formation of an independent board of consultants to help figure out how are we going to repair, rebuild, restore this spillway. Basically, after a three-day three field trip, the board of consultants surmised that the uh, original construction of the spillway is woefully inadequate. They were surprised that it actually lasted this long. They were also surprised to see that the spillway is as thin as 12 inches in some places. And the whole thing is going to have to be basically rebuilt. How are they going to do that? They're going to have to do it in two different phases. They're going to have to do an initial phase to get us through next year's flood season. And then they're going to have to do a final phase getting us through after next season. Regarding the emergency spillway, both the Board of Consultants and DWR have agreed to not under any circumstances allow the water to rise to the point where they have to ever use that emergency spillway again until they get it completely properly rebuilt to modern day standards. In the meantime, they are recommending that a cyclopean backfill be added to the emergency spillway. Now I had to look this one up. Cyclopean backfill means cutting a large trench in front of the spillway on the downstream side of the emergency spillway and adding a large amount of boulders and concrete to create a cyclopean backfill on the downstream side of the emergency spillway. They want to see that added as part of the emergency measures at this point until they come up with a plan to completely rebuild the emergency spillway to modern standards. The report goes on to discuss the interim measure to get us through next year's flood season and a final design for the spillway. And the final design basically says rebuild the entire spillway similar to the design at present, only bring it up to modern standards and get it down to solid, get it mounted onto solid bedrock this time. The interim suggests using something similar to what they got going right now but there's something I don't understand about it uh, they talk about let me get my glasses on here on page 9 they talk about the BOC's of the opinion that a temporary end of chute paving could be configured with a small flip angle to throw the discharge a distance downstream where it might impact on the remaining paved chute near the existing flip bucket. Now, how are you going to get that water to fly all the way across the plunge pool in onto the existing busted spillway? Is that what they're talking about? I don't quite understand that part of the plan. Anyways, there's the report. I'll get the link, read it, see what you think, and... Uh, It'll be very interesting to see how this next engineering race runs its course over the next year or two or more. Another interim idea that was kind of shot down was the uh, lipstick on a pig approach. Maybe we can build another spillway on top of the existing spillway upper portion to get us through the short term, but that whole entire design is going to have to be pulled out and replaced for the final design. And besides, you're putting good money after bad, pouring new concrete on top of old concrete. So that idea was shot down. So stay tuned. We'll see how these design ideas shake out. And when time and conditions permit, I'll give you a aerial overview of the Upper Feather River watershed. It's a beautiful country in the high Sierra. See you here.
Meanwhile, Pete and I decided to get into the drone business ourselves, starting with this little toy drone for 60 bucks at Best Buy. So far, Pete just gets to chase the 